postpartum is not about focusing on burning calories. And we all know, as, as personal trainers, the best way to actually burn some calories is put some muscle on. Yeah. Gain some muscle. So do your strength training and, and have your base metabolic rate go up and you can sit on your bum and burn more calories. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. In this episode, I'm discussing postpartum recovery with Peter Lapp, one of the UK's leading authorities in this critical area of women's health. From unraveling the complex condition known as diastasis recti to the unique challenges women face post-pregnancy, Peter will address misconceptions and share actionable strategies for postpartum recovery. We'll get into the physical, mental, and emotional journey that follows childbirth, uncovering truths that will challenge your assumptions, as always, and transform your perspective on women's health and fitness. This episode is for men and women alike because we all want to support the women in our lives. Peter is a postnatal expert with over 12 years of helping women recover from pregnancy and giving birth. He has written hundreds of articles on postpartum recovery, diastasis recti, postpartum back and neck pain, and advocating for better and more affordable access for women to women's health professionals. He's also the host of the Healthy Postnatal Body podcast, where he interviews expert guests and answers listener emails on anything postpartum related, and has appeared on various podcasts, radio shows, and panels. Peter. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks very much for having me, Philip. Thanks very much for the very kind introduction. Likewise. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into this. It's not a topic we really just really covered here. And I just want to start with the obvious, right? You, you're a man working in a field focused on women's health. Um, how did you find your way to becoming an expert in specifically postpartum recovery? Yeah, this is like my my what went wrong story, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> So I, I used to have a proper job a long, long time ago. I was a project manager and then I retrained to become a personal trainer. And as most PTs in the UK do, you go to personal training school, you take a course or whatever, and then you go work in a standard gym for, for, for a little while until you build up your client base. And I worked for one of the slightly more higher end gyms because, you know, they needed people. Uh, and I joined them. And I found that most of my clientele tended to be women between the ages of 25 and say 35. And one of my American friends who was a personal trainer in New York to have the same clientele, the same sort of uh, same sort of market that, that, that he said to me, he kept losing clients all the time because at that age, you know, women start families and they have kids or they already have one, but then they'll have a second. And he, he wasn't postpartum qualified. And 12 years ago, believe it or not, that wasn't a big thing at all. Uh, postpartum qualifications weren't as popular as they are now. But he said, so he couldn't really, he didn't feel comfortable training them anymore. Even though, so he had a whole bunch of clients that wanted to keep training with him, but he was not really comfortable training them. And I just thought, well, that's a silly way, as a business person, that's a silly way to lose clients. Sure. All, all you have to do is take a course and become comfortable with this stuff. Mm -hmm. So then I went to have a look at some courses. There were some courses available and I paid my money and I took the courses and all that sort of stuff. And before I knew it, I found that, within the city where I live, which is Edinburgh up in Scotland, which is Scotland's capital, um, there wasn't anybody else doing. There was nobody else doing postpartum exercise for women at all. And I've always written a lot of articles uh, about exercise and blog posts and all that sort of stuff. And the more information I kept putting out there, the more Google liked me, because 10 years ago, hardly anyone was really writing about uh, diastasis recti and all that sort of stuff. And... I was just contacted more and more by people that say, I've never heard of this. Again, postpartum, the postpartum field wasn't the same as it is now 10 years ago. Women's health wasn't the same as, as it is now 10, 10 years ago. And before I knew it, it was all I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I kind of fell into it. First of all, I kept my clients, which was awesome, right? Uh, but then, then I kind of just became the guy that does postpartum stuff. And the more I've, I, I don't know whether you experience this as, as, as a, you know, white guy. You might be younger than I am. Don't know how old you are, but I'm 48 now, right? So I'm I'm your typical middle-aged white guy. And um, problems tend not to exist until they happen to me, right? <laughs> so, so to speak. Um, and, <laughs> and, and and therefore, and because my wife and I don't have kids, we never went through this process. But the more women I spoke to, the more I found out that women's health, postpartum recovery for women just was completely unaddressed by a lot of people, um, uh, also by the healthcare system, in the UK at least. You know, in other countries you get 
quite a bit of help postpartum in the UK that just isn't a thing. And then I found out in America, it also kind of isn't a thing. Um, and so, yeah, before you know it, that's where I found myself. So this is kind of all I do now. That's a pr- that's pretty cool, right? Because I think it bucks the trend of the 99% of the time when you ask somebody where they uh, get to where they are now. It's like, well, I my personal story led me to this exact <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. It's like, of course, you couldn't have necessarily personally experienced it. But like you said, even in your own realm of of your wife or whoever else you may not have either but it was because of your clients and the demand and a lack of supply in, in the market for yeah. that and and even just tangential to women's health in general i i can see it through my clients and through my wife the the huge gap in knowledge research you go back to you know decades ago and you could see reasons why women weren't even included in sample sizes mm-hmm. for research and we lacked all this information and and yeah we're we're two two white guys in our 40s you know i'm 42 we're going to be 43 who are nonetheless, we care. We're passionate about helping people who we can help. So I, mm-hmm. I love that. And I think it means nothing's off limits for people if if we care about it and people receiving that kind of care. I think, you know, if they can find somebody who has the expertise, it almost shouldn't matter who, who's delivering it as long as it, it's helpful. So let's, let's get into the topic then, because there's a lot here, including the pronunciation of diastasis recti, which I don't know if I have. <laughs> so, is there, uh, so let's let's talk about diastasis recti, right? The mm-hmm. as I understand it, the separation of the ab muscles pretty is much, pretty yeah. common, like both during and after pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So what is it, and what symptoms can it cause? Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. First of all, the pronunciation. I call it diastasis. Some people call it diastasis. It's potato, potato. It's a dead language. It's it Latin. Really it's hard, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's not no. no I asked my daughter no how it's pronounced because she's taking Latin. I'm like, how do you pronounce oh, this? There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably that's probably the, the only way yeah. to do it because that's yeah. how it. But there is not going to be like an ancient Roman right. jumping on the podcast saying <laughs> you mispronounce with his stone tablets. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I don't really mind how 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 how, 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 how we pronounce it. Uh, basically, you're right. It is separation of the stomach muscles along that middle line that we all have that runs from the sternum to the from the sternum to the uh, pubic bone. So basically. Where your belly button is, right? That's that's in the like the center point of your body. That's kind of where where the muscles start to move away a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is like the center of uh, of it. Then the tends to be so the muscles move apart because you know when you're and I always say diastasis recta. The cause of it is internal pressure, it's not necessarily pregnancy. It can be an injury. It can be just a build up of uh, you see a lot of people who brace too much. I have a lot of uh, ballet dancers that, that get it because they lift heavy things and they're they're holding their breath as they lift heavy things. And then it becomes a sort of a, um, a repetitive strain injury because that's fundamentally what it is, prolonged internal pressure on the core muscles. And that means that everything just moves apart. Now, obviously, during pregnancy, that is because you're growing a human in there, right? which is an awesome thing to do. So... What no, hold find... on before you get there. So I've sure. I've never heard of this happening to like a man who lifts weights and uses a, a belt and, and lifts really heavy and they brace. But does it? How often is this? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, is not it? that much. You find yeah. it a lot in people with weak cores. So oh, okay, okay. I I, so if, I, you, I, if you've um... built it up over time, maybe that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, yeah, if okay. you're an experienced lifter and all of a sudden, because then what you get if you're I an experienced see. lifter and all of a sudden you have an injury that tends to be a hernia injury. Right. That makes more sense. What, okay. what we do find with people who are office workers and people in wheelchairs, believe it or not, people in wheelchairs have this a lot because every time they have to get in and out of the wheelchair, if they push themselves up and they're bracing, that mm. core, because you've been sedentary all day, that core mm. just isn't strong enough to constantly deal with that in, internal pressure. So, yeah, I should have made that clear. In guys, it's really No, not at all. I was common. curious. I was curious um, about it. Yeah. But, but it does happen in men. So, if there are guys listening to this, you know, the the big, I, I always say this, you see this a lot in the UK, I'm guessing a lot in America as well now for guys listening to this. You know how you have some people that look amazing in a t-shirt, that look phenomenal, and then you get to the belly and the belly is round, mm-hmm. right? That is internal pressure on the core, fundamentally. And you might find that when you address that, actually there's a bit of separation of the stomach muscles happen because the internal pressure is just constantly there. Now, what is actually happening here is that your muscles are out of position. That's fundamentally what's causing it. Like like you said, separation. 
And that's along that lineal. So that's that middle line that I spoke about, along the belly button and all that sort of stuff. Now, there's a fascia sheet there, a, a fascia sheet mm -hmm. there. And that is essentially the bit that is stretching. So that's why men can also get this. Because if you constantly have a, a, a bloated belly, so to speak, then that fascia sheet stretches. And then when you bring it together, all of a sudden, the fascia sheet is weak and it's stretched, right? So it's just not visceral fat from drinking too much alcohol. I'm just kidding. Uh, there's different, no, there's different but, things. But yes, <laughs> it, it's, it's a different cause, no, 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 but same I'm thing. Just... Yeah. Um, so to understand, because understanding that this is not caused by pregnancy is quite a, is quite a biggie. It's just mm -hmm. caused by internal pressure. Mm -hmm. And that really matters for postpartum recovery because 100% of women who are pregnant have diastasis recti. 100%. You physically cannot grow a baby in there and stay completely flat. That is impossible. It has never been done. That doesn't mean it's a problem for everyone, but that, that's a different beast altogether. Postpartum, we find that after six weeks, about 80% of women still have some form of diastasis recta. If you use a narrow definition, and I won't go in too much detail, but fundamentally for diastasis recti, what matters is the width of the gap the depth of the gap, and in my humble opinion, muscle functionality is mm. actually the key. Whether your core still does what it should be doing. Mm. So when we understand this caused by internal pressure, then you can realize and um, most guys listening to this who have wives and most women listening to this who are postpartum at some stage, and it doesn't matter whether you're 10 or 20 years postpartum, you'll find that sometimes when we eat food, that bloats our belly as well, right? I can't have a Domino's without my belly immediately swelling up to the size of a balloon. That matters if you're trying to heal diastasis recta. Okay. Because it's really difficult to put everything back in its place if the food you're eating is constantly increasing pressure. The, if, if I mean, we're trying to flatten the balloon, so to speak. If we constantly keep putting air in that balloon, then of course that balloon is never going to shrink. Okay. So understanding that matters because it means that quite often postpartum, uh, your body responds differently to different types of food. And every woman in the world will understand what I'm talking about. Now, you used to be able to used to be fine with apples pre prenatal, and all of a sudden postpartum, you look at an apple and, it, and you start bloating already. That mm -hmm. means that whilst you're trying to do this rehab exercise, which essentially is what postpartum recovery exercise is. It's the same as a frozen shoulder and doing shoulder rehab. You just want to lay off the apples a bit as well. Mm. Uh, because if they're causing the bloating, then they are not helping you in the moment. Yeah, it doesn't mean you always need to cut out apples. It just means that in the moment for rehab, that's kind of where you need to, where you need to be. I'm sorry if that got way too boring for everybody. No, it's not, I'm I'm fascinated by it. So I always say, and look, we're coming up on 100 episodes. If my audience is bored and I'm not, then they're not my audience because <laughs> I love this stuff. The ones that do will listen. So, yeah. all right, what? Why is it a problem? I guess is is another thing I want to understand. I love all the mm -hmm. things about preventing the symptoms by paying attention to your food, and then also how it, it's different for different women, and it's it's the principle mm -hmm. of the separation, not so much that it's caused only by pregnancy, but it's but it affects all pregnant yeah. women. So why is it a problem? That, and that is the big question because for a lot of women, it used to be an aesthetic problem. They didn't like the way it looked, and that's completely fine, and it's a valid reason for addressing something i mean i go to the gym predominantly to stay healthy but also to look half reasonable yep. right i want to look half human by the time i'm 60 70 years old that's why i go so i always say aesthetics is a completely decent reason to address a problem the main issue for diastasis recti is that muscle functionality is quite often impaired when you have uh, diastasis recti and if your deep core, because that's quite often the, the one of the problem areas, your your transverse abdominis and, and all that sort of stuff, uh, which is the 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 middle layer of of your three layers of core muscles for anybody listening, right? Um, if that is not working properly, that means sooner or later other muscles will start to kick in and work too hard, right? And in ninety nine out of 99 out of 100 cases that I come across, that tends to be the back muscles that will start to mm, yes. kick in, especially the deep core back muscles, uh, your QL and all that sort of stuff. 
right? And again, that is just for everybody listening, that is not the superficial muscles that you feel. This is your deep core stuff that basically the most important of all the core muscles. These are the mm -hmm. ones that protect your spine and yes. that make sure you can rotate without any pain and all that sort of stuff. This is not the get a Swedish massage and a nice rub down type, type stuff, right? Uh, and when muscles are out of place, as, as a physio would tell you, which you kind of tend to have with diastasis and a weak course, things are, your body tends not to be in alignment. Your glutes aren't quite firing up properly. Uh, that needs to be addressed because your balance is affected. If you're an athlete, your athletic ability is severely impaired if your body isn't functioning optimally. But just in daily life, if you think about what women have to do, women with kids, what they have to do to get from point A to point B in a car. They have to carry buggies and travel systems and a bag full of stuff. And you can have a toddler that is fighting against you and throwing a little tantrum that is constantly jerking uh, into you and all that sort of stuff. If, if your core isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, that's when injuries happen, is what I always say. It's it's yeah. a life it's a life thing much more than just a oh the muscles don't work I will deal with it. Um, this is where back pain kind of comes from. Okay, I love that you brought up all that. So for those who listen to this show not long ago, probably about ten episodes ago, we talked to Dr. Ryan Peebles about core training and the deep core, mm -hmm. and how it propagates into back pain. And it's a very nice tie in here oh, nice, um, yeah. to all of that. And I, I hear what you're saying because we often hear of injuries. In any context, not even this con just this context of often happening when you, you know, you're doing something beyond your level of strength or movement capability yeah. that you haven't trained for, and so you often hear even someone who's very strong they'll go and they'll reach way over for something to put it on a truck, and that's when they'll their back will have an issue, not the 400 pound deadlift that they did. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> So yeah, glutes not firing, your balance affected. There's a whole propagation of issues. So it's very important, mm -hmm. it sounds like, to address this earlier than later. So that leads to the question, what kind of training or therapy do you recommend for managing it? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question because it's exactly, the issue is exactly what you said it was. It is exactly your body is not capable of doing the things you're asking it to do, mm -hmm. right? That's fundamentally how, how injuries happen. And that means that when you do any sort of rehab training, and like I said, I suspect I recover any sort of postpartum training is part of that. You have to go slow. Your muscles aren't doing the things they're supposed to do. So I always say the first three to four weeks, and this is a how long is a piece of strain sort of scenario, right? If you were really active during pregnancy, your muscle activation will be better. If you were still squatting up until the, the day before your due date and all that sort of stuff, your glutes will be much more active than someone who's been sedentary for their entire uh, and, and entire like six, seven, eight, nine months period. But predominantly, I always start with a nice, steady, get the body fired up again. So we start with doing some glute bridges and all that sort of stuff. And by, I think, top of my head, the first four-week uh, home program that I do, it's like, uh, and this is not a sales thing, right? So this is just that I do with all my postpartum clients. We do some heel slides. Uh, we do a core breath. That's the first thing. Learning how to breathe properly is essential. We do some heel slides where you just lie on the floor, you stretch one leg out and you bring that back in and see how your mm -hmm. core responds to that. We do some glute bridges, not even single leg glute bridges, but just bog standard lying on the floor, glute bridges, no weight, you squeeze your bum. We do some squats, we do some reverse lunges. And that's pretty much it. Basic stuff. And we try to do 10 to 15 reps of all this sort of stuff. Not because we're looking for, and I'm sure you've discussed high uh, rep ranges and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. a lot on this podcast. Not because we're looking for hypertrophy. We're just looking for, because uh, I get asked this question a lot. Why is it 10? I'm not trying to get a bigger bum. By doing some bodyweight glute bridges, no one's ever built a big bum that way. We're just looking to make sure that your glutes are doing the work and not your hamstrings. Because how often do we see someone walking into a gym and they're banging out some amazing looking glute bridges with a big barbell, but it's their hamstrings doing all the work. For sure. Right? That is just another way to get injured. So that's where we're starting. So it's just building that up. And the more we ask of the body over a three to four month period, again, how long is the piece of string? For some people, it'll be a bit longer. It depends on how your pregnancy went, whether you had a C-section, whether it's your second or third child, whether you've been active beforehand or whether it's six weeks ago or 20 years ago, 
right? It's a muscular problem, so it can always be addressed by exercise. That's what I always say. doesn't matter if it's 20 years ago, but your recovery time will increase rather exponentially if you do. Um, we just ask a bit more of the body every three to four weeks. And the thing is, because it's a rehab thing, we do this every day, right? That is quite often the key. Going to the gym once a week for an hour with a personal trainer won't help okay. Okay. unless you do your home exercises. It's physio stuff. It's uh, I don't know if you've ever had a shoulder injury or anything like that. Loads of I uh, I'm recovering from rotator repair right now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> rotator cuff repair. <laughs> I haven't started my physical therapy though. I'm only a month out. <laughs> but you know, the 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 recovery for that will be boring as anything. Right. It's not going to be fun. Right. You're not going to right. do big shoulder presses, military Absolutely. presses, right. all that sort of stuff. It's boring, it's repetitive, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely essential that you do it. Otherwise, you won't heal properly and it's going to cause you a problem later on. You can any sort of rehab stuff, frozen shoulder or what, what you're talking about. I, I love the shoulder because everybody has shoulder pain, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I love giving that as an example. But all that sort of stuff, we can all rush through it very easily. It is not a problem to rush through shoulder stuff and then be fine with life and just have a niggling shoulder for the rest of your life, right? It'll just be that old shoulder injury. Yeah. The problem is... Sooner or later, you're going to have to take a couple of weeks off because your shoulder is flaring up massively after you did some big shoulder presses and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, all of a sudden you can't really train clients anymore because you can't show them how to do a proper shoulder press because overhead movement is a bit tough. Mm -hmm. And you just, and you'd be a bit, and therefore it starts impact on the way you live your life, right? All of a sudden you have to ask your wife to reach for things off the top shelf because, you know, your, your stiff shoulder will, and, and that's what I always say with regards to postpartum recovery as well, that it is dull in the beginning. It's not exciting in the beginning. You just do 10 minutes every day, but you have to do them every day because you have to mm -hmm. retrain your body to use the right muscles again that they haven't used for three, four, five months at least if you're talking about postpartum recovery. So this is a, I, I love the specificity of your answer, you know, telling us specific movements and rep ranges. That's really good because people get an idea of what you're talking about and it, it is a rehab protocol. So you're not, yeah. you know, you're not hitting high intensity three days a week. You're hitting, uh, you know, a high rep, a high rep range for, you know, the light resistance. I don't know if it's going to be bands yeah. or body yeah, weight, like exactly. you said, bands, yeah. right. Every day, which, which makes sense. What about, what's the difference between women who might've been training beforehand and after should is how valuable is this training protocol versus easing back into whatever they were already doing and the body mm. just recovering back to normal on its own you know we'll yeah talk about that. that that's again that, that's a great question because women who train during their pregnancy are or athletes i've trained one or two tennis players and all that sort of stuff and they don't stop training just because they're pregnant they do still do competitions they've got money to make these are not like top 10 level in the world tennis players i'm not talking serena williams sure. i'm talking about people who tour and have to tour and make 30 grand a year whilst working like a beast they find that their postpartum recovery is simply much better because their muscles still mm -hmm. know what to do Right, that muscle hasn't been inactive for mm -hmm. three to four or five months, and therefore that early stage of postpartum recovery is simply shorter for them. Nothing fancy. I mean, the first four to six weeks of muscle activation that's usually two to three, and that's fine. Then they're completely fine, and then we can start to to place more of the demand on 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 the muscles, so right. they progress through the program a bit quicker. And mm -hmm. some of them only need a post a, a recovery program really shortly because this is all individualized, right? In right. an ideal world, personal training, the important part isn't the training element, it's the mm -hmm. personal element of it. And in an ideal world, everybody gets their own personal uh, personal program. So for these for some of these women, I've I've seen them for like a month and then they're like, okay, I'm good to go. I can do whatever I want in it because they know what to do. Sure. I, I I'm super, as a, as a PT. I view myself as as some sort of, you know, you have those rotator belts in a restaurant and you just pick your thing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that That's what I, I'm an assembly line. I have a client, I fix them, I move them out. Right. Simply because I can, it's rehab stuff. I don't want to, I love working with some people for eight, nine, 10 years, but yeah. that is not my, that's not my goal. I want to fix people so I can help the next person. And for, so for some women, that is a month and then they can go about their merry business. 
For other people, and this is tends to be the case of women who were not active during the pregnancy or haven't never trained all that much or who did different things prenatal. So if you do a lot of cardio during your uh during your pregnancy, that is awesome and that is phenomenal and that is fantastic. And I'm not knocking it, but it's not going to help your postpartum recovery when it comes mm-hmm. to rehab stuff. I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because because yeah. lots of women lots of women do do this because they get told to, you know, right. when you've just given birth, the best exercise to do is what they're told is to go walking. Yeah, no, it isn't. It just isn't the best exercise to do postpartum. Walking is awesome and you need to leave the house anyway. So I'm not quite sure why, who that comment is aimed at. Sure, you should be doing it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But but it doesn't help your postpartum recovery from a rehab perspective. It doesn't get your glutes fired up unless you're walking up a hill mm-hmm. or indeed down the hill. Um, it, your core activation won't necessarily improve unless you're off balance or you're asking your core to to do stuff for sure. you. And w- walking does very little for them. Um, so, so that is kind of the type of activity you do in prenatal or, and, and during your pregnancy really matters for your postpartum recovery. But predominantly, the program is any sort of rehab program is kind of the same for most variations of diastasis recti. You have three or four different variations but the recovery is kind of the same for absolutely every single one of them yeah it sounds just like any time you are going to have a change in your situation like you said surgery i've had two surgeries and in both cases i kept lifting right up until the surgery and then the recovery is really fast you know it's the same thing but i don't know how many i don't know how many i can't speak for women i don't know how many women who are pregnant are are very aware that this is can be thought of in that way, right? Like I'm sure yeah. it could be, I don't remember my wife talking about it. So she mean not have experienced it to an extent that it was an issue, but I guess that's where I'm going is how do you know it's, it even needs recovery. I guess you said all women get it, but are you, do yeah. you get a test? Do you measure something? Is there, you know, uh, circumference measurements? Like what do you do to kind of figure yeah. out you need that, to take that action? Yeah. That, 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 that's a good question. Yes. For most women, what happens is they get a six weeks postpartum checkup. Right, they go. You go to your GP after six weeks, and what the GP tends to do, they mainly look at the baby for ten minutes, and then they give you a quick cursory glance to make sure still alive. You're good. Yeah, you're still alive. You're good. You're not <laughs> going to kill yourself, right? That is the yeah. in very to be very blunt. You get asked about postpartum depression, and but that's kind of, of where they leave it. Of course. Sometimes you get a good GP, and they say, okay, let's also check your your core muscles and see how that mm-hmm. goes. They basically lie on the table. We put a couple of fingers along that linear album. and there's tons of videos on how to measure diastasis recti uh, online on, on YouTube. It's on my YouTube channel as well. I have a slightly different way of doing it, but predominantly you lie on your back, place your middle fingers, uh, place a finger along that, that line that I spoke about, and you just see how wide that gap is, how deep you can put the finger and all that sort mm. of stuff. That doesn't test muscle functionality at all, yeah, sure. right? That is just a width measurement. Uh, and as I always tell everybody, that if you're going to measure diastasis recti that way, it's completely valid to do it that way. Make sure you get a tape measure out. Because I have big, big sausage fingers. And if I measure you, you're going to have two centimeter, two finger separation. And if you measure yourself and you are built like my wife is, for instance, who has much smaller hands than I do, you can fit three fingers in there. And if you take that home and I tell you, you have two finger separation and a week later you measure yourself and you tell yourself, I've got three finger separation. The first instinct isn't, oh, my fingers must be smaller. The first instinct is, oh my God, it has gotten worse. Hmm. Right? So we need to get a tape measure out to make sure. I always get my clients to measure their own. I I sit next to them and show them how to do it, but say, use your own fingers. Your own fingers won't change that much in size Mm -hmm. and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. And even then I still use the tape measure. Then what I do is just some basic exercises. Can you lift your legs without your stomach doming? Can you do that with bent knees? Can you do it with straight legs? Some A leg raise, as most of your listeners will be familiar with the exercise, but there is a leg raise, puts a tremendous amount of pressure on your core. How many people do we see that their stomach bulges when they do a leg raise? Or they start bouncing up and down when they do a leg raise because it's predominantly their hip flexors and momentum doing all the work. Mm-hmm. Right, we want to make sure the right muscles are doing things. Like I said, with glute bridges, is it your glutes that are doing the work, or is it your hamstrings that are doing the work? Those questions, those those two things, are actually the main ways that I just go with. Okay, 
what's your what's your muscle activation like? A side plank with dips is also a nice way to do it because we want to know if your obliques are doing their doing their job. Okay. And not everybody has equipment in the house to do like wood chopper type exercises and bail off presses and, and all that sort of stuff. So those three things, right? So you put your fingers in there, you see how wide the gap is, you see how far you can get your finger in there to see how deep the gap is. And then you do some glute bridges, you do some leg raises, and you do a side plank with dips, and that'll tell you whether your muscles are working properly cool. or not. Very straightforward, very prescriptive. Love it. It's a it's a so, doddle. Yeah. <laughs> that's but that's what we want, you know. That's the thing. The least sexiest uh, solutions are usually the most effective. Um True. so we know how to maybe recognize it. We know uh, why it happens. We know the differences when you are training versus not training and the importance of strength training, not just cardio and walking. And then you mentioned the the recovery period. Besides that form of recovery you talked about with the rehab, is there, are there any other strategies for recovery um, and not eating apples if that doesn't work for you? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the main strategy for recovery is kind of still keep challenging your body as be- whenever you can. So Right, something that we tend to forget quite a lot uh, as personal trainers in in gyms, at least. You, you, you know, everybody listening to this will probably have signed up to a gym at one stage, and you get your induction with a personal trainer. That's the way usually you get your first free program from the gym. Right, these are the exercises you need to do, and they'll say that this is a program, and then you do the program for three, four, five months. Right. And that's usually one session. That is not an actual program. They usually give you a session plan exercises to do for a month. And they say, come back to me in a month's time and I'll sell you a new one. And no one shows up for the second appointment. Right. Because all of a sudden it's going to cost you money and all this sort of thing. The issue is that if you do the same stuff that you're meant to do for a week or two weeks or three weeks or a month for four, five, six months, you're wasting your time for at least four months of that because you're not challenging yourself. And the whole point of this is that any good program has to be progressive. And that includes for postpartum exercise, that includes doing the things you want to do. One of the things that I used to forget a lot about is that, you know, I used to be one of those guys that said, hit high intensity interval training. That's the best way to do it, man. That's amazing. And that's the most effective way of training. And I'm kind of completely in a different camp. It's amazing. If you love HIT, you do it every day. That's phenomenal. If you do HIT once a week or you do Zumba classes seven times a week, yeah, your Zumba is going to do more for you than the HIT classes. Mm. Not as a standalone, but as a the result you'll get from constantly and consistently doing exercise and movement. That That's a no-brainer. So make sure that if you like kettlebell stuff, there isn't anything scary about a kettlebell swing if you're postpartum. If your glutes are working, your core is working, go take a kettlebell class. Do your thing. Any exercise you have, and this is the biggest takeaway any, anyone can get, I think, from any sort of postpartum thing. Once your muscles are working nicely, you can do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And that is essential because it means you can go back to the gym. And if you like your kettlebell classes, if you like to deadlift, I've heard so many stories about people saying, I can't hold a plank postpartum because I have diastasis recti. Are your, are your muscles working? Yes. That means the plank will help heal your diastasis recti. Strengthening muscles up is an essential part of a rehab program. Deadlifts. I, I, I had clients that gave birth uh, with two twins. So they had a plant C-section. And one of my clients was squatting 100 kg the day before her due date. One rep, we didn't go nuts. She just wanted to make sure, you know, she wanted yeah. she wanted to go in to the OR and she was a surgeon herself. She so she was going to be operated yeah. on by so that's, her colleagues. That's two plates. That's two plates for people. 225 for Americans. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 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 I mean that is she wanted to walk into the hospital and just go get my operation. I still squatted the hundred kg the day before. Uh the day for and postpartum. Took her a month and she was back to squatting 40 kg. Yeah. She couldn't go back to 100. Her body wasn't ready for it yet. Yeah. Um, but if you like to squat, you go squat. It doesn't matter. You slowly, but surely, and you keep an eye on what you're doing. Any exercise, absolutely any exercise, helps with your postpartum recovery as long as you don't overdo it. I love it. I love it. I mean, so many things you said there is gold. You mentioned progression. We talk about progressive overload all the time in in different contexts. You mentioned don't be afraid of any particular movement if you do it right and it's at the right you know level of um, where you're at. I mean, treat treat the pregnancy like a 
kind of like an injury or like a disruption yeah. or a detraining yeah. event and work back into it. You, you'd probably like my, uh, my former client. She was Tyla Ciro. She was also on the podcast a couple of times. She's a power lifter here in Connecticut. Yeah. And she was posting video right up until, you know, a week before she was, you know, had, had her baby of just lifting, uh, mm -hmm. lifting everything, you know, lighter weights. Cause by the time you, like you said, but right before pregnancy, you tend to dial back <laughs> a little, you don't want to yeah. over brace and things, but that's a great message for people because we do use excuses, all of us of whatever mm -hmm. it is. And I think lifting weights is never a bad thing. Uh, you know, unless you have an injury that that's preventing it. So Good, good message, uh, Peter. That's, that's awesome. I'm glad um, you agree, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> We're in agreement. I don't have to kick you off the show. Um, Hi, this is Alan. I just want to give a shout out to Philip Pape at Wits and Weights for his nutritional coaching. His coaching is based upon science, research, intellect, and wisdom. His coaching is safe, supportive, connecting, and it actually has helped reset my compass in terms of how I direct my health the action steps I do and really, really has helped me regain trust and belief in what my body can do and how my body can change. Okay. So another side topic to this is the pressure to lose the baby weight. Cause I know mm -hmm. we're going to get into some things, some of the more controversial topics here, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The pressure to lose baby weight. That's very pervasive. Should this be on the list of priorities for women postpartum, like wanting to lose weight? And I, I understand everybody has a vanity or everybody has different yeah. reasons and vanity can be one and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But but what are your thoughts on this in general? But generally speaking, and I always tell people this because most women don't know this. What happens during your um, antenatal class is most women go to an antenatal class, and if if you have, you know you have the kids, you go together, right? You're that, mm -hmm. and you're basically just you have to exchange phone numbers so you can have coffee mornings with women postpartum. Because the 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 messages you pick up in most antenatal classes are nonsense and they're rather toxic. Okay, so there'll be messages such as breastfeeding will help you lose weight. No, it won't. Breastfeeding has never helped anyone lose weight to lose weight. It'll burn some calories, yeah, but you need to eat to compensate for that, right? So <laughs> it it so is true. it's breastfeeding is a zero sum game. It genuinely is if you do it right. The reason I always tell people, tell women to not focus on weight loss postpartum is because you still have all those hormones flowing through your body, mm. and breastfeeding is a part of that. Prolactin, for instance, which is the hormone that helps you produce breast milk, will make you gain five to ten pounds. For every woman in the world, that is true. So how are you going to fight that postpartum? How are you going to, if you want to lose that baby, five, 10 pounds isn't going anywhere. Right. You're going to starve. You're going to be an energy deficiency to do it. Which yeah. Is and, and now yeah. you have a baby that needs nutrients. And I thought, I once wrote, and I think I copied it somewhere onto my new website as well, but I, I once wrote an article called Your Baby is a Parasite. That got me a lot of angry emails, but there's a lot of truth to it. As a, and by parents, I, I don't mean anything bad about the kids. I just mean that the babies will get nutrients from your body, mm -hmm. right? So if you are underfed and, and undernourished, especially undernourished, where is your kid going to get all this healthy stuff from, right? And this is why I find a lot of the time you see a lot of women, obviously they're, they're sleep deprived and all this sort of stuff, but they're walking around not quite looking. They don't have their natural glow anymore. Because they've been so focused on losing weight and not not focused on eating right, that they become nutrient deficient. Mm -hmm. They 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 just are, the baby will take a lot of this stuff. And this is not to talk people out of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is in an ideal world, people breastfeed. Breast milk is the better way over formula and all that sort of stuff. If you can help, if you can do it, that's an awesome way to do it. But it makes weight loss a, a very silly thing to focus on. Is, is what I mean, because I don't like to be harsh about this sort of stuff, because I understand that women have a tremendous amount of pressure put on them to bounce back and all that sort of stuff, you know, in a way that I can never understand. So I understand that. But to focus on that is just insane. And, sure. and the more we move away from the, and this is, again, the National Health Service in the UK advises this on their website, is mm. well, to burn some calories, go for a walk. Postpartum is not about focusing on burning calories. And we all know, as as personal trainers, the best way to actually burn some calories is put some muscle on. Yeah, gain some muscle. So do your strength training, 
and and have your base metabolic rate go up and you can sit on your bum and burn more calories. Yeah, I, I was going to go there. I was like, this is, it's kind of like when we periodize our nutrition and some days, like as, at least from a man's perspective, you know, I want to put on that power belly as I'm building muscle and I'm, I'm cool mm. with it because I know it's building muscle. But uh, yeah, both while you're in pregnancy, because again, I've had some clients that while they were pregnant, you know, we're like, we're not losing weight. We have to gain mm. weight. So let's yeah. just intentionally make the most of that. And then after you're pregnant, during uh, breastfeeding, like you said, treating it as a muscle building phase is a beautiful way to do it because now yeah. it's serving all your goals and not going against you in the nutrition and, and health department. The stuff about you know breastfeeding, we won't get into all the the all of that. Um, yeah, but, sure. Yeah, but what about people who? No, no, and that's fine. No, I, I mean I think everybody knows that today, right? That's yeah, yeah, it, and not everybody can do it, and there's reasons you can't do it that are for various reasons, right? And some mm -hmm. women aren't able to, so that's fine you know, my, actually our first daughter couldn't, uh, keep down anything. And so we had to supplement, right. you know, there's always yeah, different. Yeah, reasons. exactly. There's completely legit <laughs> reasons. I always yeah. say that your job is keeping your baby alive in the best way yeah, possible. Anything <laughs> after that, I don't care about how you do it. Gravy. So now what about if a woman is not breastfeeding? Does that, that whole thing go out the window? Or are there still other reasons to not rush into, uh, thinking about weight loss? Well, I, I always think that, you know, when we have to prioritize in life, we have to decide what is important to us and, and, and we do the things we can do. Uh, when I don't know about you, but when I work with clients who tend to be sleep deprived, as a lot of uh, new moms are, okay, like where you're going. Uh, <laughs> who have high stress levels, potentially high, uh, high anxiety or high depression levels or whatever, the, the just elevated levels of anxiety, because all of a sudden, you know, things, uh, things you never used to worry about such as driving a car through city center are a lot more scary with a new baby in the back of the car. Because mm. all of a sudden, is this guy is he going to stop? Is he going to crash into me? So anxiety levels are a little bit higher. So the hormonal response, I don't, I always say was that people in an anxious state struggle to lose weight more than people who are relaxed and chilled about it. This is why I have a ton of clients that they go to Dubai on holiday for a couple of weeks and they come back lighter than they were when they were working 80, 90 hour weeks. So true. Their expenditure just jumps. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. They, they've been stuffing their face and they, but they've been chilling on the beach. And they've been yeah, switching it's true. off. It's amazing. Right? And, and it's a genuine, it's, it's a genuine thing. I'm not making this up, dear listener. Uh, and then we have to prioritize stuff. I, I have to prioritize my gym time and my work and, and, and my family and all that sort of stuff. So I want to do the thing that is going to get me the most bang for my buck. And that is simply get your rehab training done first. Right? That's good. Get yeah. your strength training done first. Make sure your body functions well. Because part of raising a, a new healthy human being is being as pleasant to be around them as possible. And what I find is that when you're confident, when my confidence is low, by looking at my own family, my confidence is low because I'm feeling crap or I'm in pain. Uh, have you heard of the pain cycle? You know, where, where you're in pain, it gets yes. a bit worse. And yes. your relations, that, that's that type of stuff. You start to take that out on people. Mm -hmm. Not deliberately. I'm not saying you shout at your wife or your spouse or your kid or you, you do silly things, but your mood is not what it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of raising a healthy human being is ha having the most caring and nurturing environment. Mm -hmm. And taking care of yourself is a huge part of that. And weight loss doesn't really come into that. It, it is just not part of that discussion for me postpartum. Uh, I agree. Okay. Yeah. If you yeah, yeah if, if you don't breastfeed or you don't express, can you lose weight? Yeah, sure. But should it be your focus? Right. Uh, in my opinion, not not unless you're preparing for a movie role. If you're Margot Robbie going yeah. to do Barbie and you get 10, sure. 20, 30 sure. million bucks, then it's your job. Sure. Yeah, like uh, like you said, it depends on your goals and whether it's serving you and your life. I do love how you talked about stress overall, life stress, chronic stress as a, a sort of tax on your body or uh, some a firm term that I sometimes use is like your energy stack, your metabolic stack. It's like you want to build this nice, big, robust tower of of energy production in your body at, rather than trying to cut and restrict and, and lose. Because at the end of the day, like you said, you may just naturally slowly get back to the weight you want to be anyway, but you're doing it in a healthy, abundant way, not a restrictive way. But the whole thing about anxiety and depression does lead to the other question I wanted to ask about, which is postpartum depression, because we know this affects a lot of women. I saw the statistics recently. I want to say it's 
anywhere from like one and eight to two and eight, something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the, the numbers are huge. Yeah. yeah, it's huge. And even beyond that, in some smaller level. Yeah. And I've had many women in my life who experienced various levels of this, some to the point where the, they couldn't be with the child for a bit. Mm-hmm. You know, it was that serious. And there's a lot of gaslighting. I mean, talking about women's health and talking about like just there's differences between generations I've seen or like how mm-hmm. older generations like act like it doesn't exist sometimes. And then anyway, how do you help your clients cope with this? Because it does come into the equation, it comes into the stress, anxiety. And it is, it is a like, huge part yeah. of it. It, yeah, is, yeah. it is, it is huge. And when you, when you, cause when you say things like one and eight and two and eight, and you're right, those are the stats. Yeah. We forget just how huge that number really is when we're talking yeah. actual numbers, like the small city I live in 600,000 people. 600,000 occupants, 5,000 babies are born every year to 4,500 different months or something like that. Mm-hmm. That means out of those 4,500 uh, 4, months, 1,000 will suffer from PPD. Mm-hmm. It's That's just in a 600,000 city. The numbers are astronomically huge. And indeed, like you said, there's a there's this real... Well, let me put it this way. One of my clients, she won't mind me mentioning this, she had baby number five mm-hmm. and a couple two sets of twins and then then a fifth uh by a standalone baby so to speak um and she didn't cope with it particularly well her husband referred to it as yes she has the baby blues and i'm like dude i want to i want to kill you right now the baby blues are we still using that phrase it's, 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 it's dismissive insane. right <laughs> it, it, yeah more especially when you're talking about people that suffer from intrusive thoughts as, as as they call it these days not necessarily i want to harm myself but you know you could harm a lot can go wrong when you're when you're feeling that way i always say that and this goes for all my clients exercise should never be stressful if i have sessions planned with my clients and they say last minute uh, dude i want to cancel i'm not i'm not up for it today don't worry about it mm-hmm. i don't have a cancellation policy unless you text me saying i cannot be bothered because i got drunk last night I charge you for that session because that's punishment for your for your sins. There you go. <laughs> anything else, I don't tend to charge for because of the clientele that I work with, right? So a lot of the time when I have uh, when I have a session, it happens regularly. I don't say a lot of time regularly. The women will have just bathed the baby, cleaned the baby up for me coming to their house to do. A lot of my clients have home gyms and all that sort of stuff. Where I go to their houses and. The baby throws up last minute. And now we have to start the whole process again. So now she's running around like a maniac because Peter is coming in 15 minutes time. Mm. Just send me a text. I'll be 15. I'll, I'll sit in the car for 15 minutes. Mm. Do your thing. It's no big deal. Removing stress from anyone who suffers from postpartum depression is just a small thing, but it can really help. I just don't want to be part of the problem. I love that. Yeah. De- uh, see how you can help or at least not interfere. Cause I've seen, yeah, I've seen that too. Like, you know, people who are close to, to the person one, wondering why they're not X, Y, Z, wondering why they're not responding to me or letting me visit or this or that. And it's like, just back off, you know, like they need a little space right yeah, now. Just, yeah, it's exactly. And just yeah. indeed, just, just, just respect that. I, I don't have the solution for anyone's sure. postpartum depression. No, that, you know, that's what doctors are for and psychiatrists and all this mm-hmm. stuff. But I can indeed at least not be part of the problem. So I am chill. You want to cancel last minute? Did you cancel last minute? I've got paperwork to do. It is fine. It's never a big deal. And I make that very clear to my clients so that they don't need to feel guilty about about having to cancel. But like I said, that doesn't necessarily go for all PTs. Right? If I'm working with, sure. if I were to work with a bodybuilder and he cancels last minute, he's just being a jackass. Yeah, or, yeah I get it. Or, <laughs> the level but, of compassion that you need for exactly, a specific yeah. group of people. I want to respect your time because I know technology wise, we got started late. Do you have yeah, five, yeah, 10 fine. minutes? Yeah, okay. yeah be good. Be good. Yeah. All right, cool. Just, just a few more. So another, I, well, maybe not controversial, but I think you've mentioned that the health and fitness industry is just like ripping off postpartum women. I want you, <laughs> wanted to elaborate on that. Statement. Sure. <laughs> um, the, this is something I found in the, it's, it's really odd when we see, especially online, because uh, the online, obviously, people are listening to podcasts and all that sort of stuff. So what I find online is that if I want to do a bodybuilding program or a get ripped weight loss type program, I pay 69 bucks. 
right? It doesn't matter which one you go to. You can go to Athlete X. You can go to anyone. Yeah, yeah you've got 69 bucks. Yeah, 69, 47, 97. Yeah, something, range, yeah, yeah, jumps yeah, all over the place. Exactly. But it's, it's always down from 200 bucks to 69 right, bucks, right? Because right? they're all on off. Promotion, yeah, uh, it's always a promotion. Yeah, exactly. Look for postpartum stuff and find me one that is below 150 bucks. Okay, okay. 297, 497. 297, yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, the real value, one of my colleagues, so to speak, let me put it that way, had something online saying, my program is worth $2,500. I will sell it to you for 250 bucks or $500 or whatever it was at the time. The, the biggest selling uh, postpartum program in the world, and I won't name it here because I don't want to crap on anyone's parade, but the biggest selling program selling in the world had... 18 price fluctuations that I know of in the past five years. They started off at 100, then they thought, ah, we can get away with charging 200 pounds, so $300. The last one that I called them out on, because I sent them an email, was 99 pounds, so that's what, 120 bucks for a year access. This is a 12 week program, mm -hmm. 12 modules, they call it now, but it's a 12 week program, or you can pay 30 bucks a month. I said, what about people that don't have a hundred bucks in sitting in their account, right? If you, because all most of these programs do what I do, and they talk about how they like to help women. Yeah, but if you only like to help wealthy women, then how realistically what what do you really like to do? And for an online program, I'm not talking again. I'm not talking about face to face PT. Face to face PT is a different thing, and then you're dealing with travel time and all that sort of stuff. But for online programs. There is no reason why a postpartum rehab program should be more expensive than a weight loss program. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of videos. It is not. It is not extraordinary. It's, it's, it's the level of um, the level of desperation is probably a lot higher, causing that demand, right? Well, and that's the thing. And when you look at most of yeah. these things that are sold, and this is part of the whole unethical mm -hmm. practices for me, is the the idea that a lot of these people say, "Well, when I was pregnant, I had to find all this stuff out for myself." And therefore, I decided to put together the blah, 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 the, the program. I'm like, no, you didn't have to find anything out for yourself. Because if you did. <laughs> oh, now you're getting into marketing. Are you kidding me? If you want to go yeah. down that rabbit hole, Peter, you could, you could tear up any. Yeah, you, you, you can do. Yeah, yeah. You, I know but, what you mean. But because what they're selling is that you can look like me sort yeah, of thing sure. quite often. Yeah, yeah. right? And, and that's, again, I completely get it. But I can't look like The Rock. Because first of all, genetically, I'm not the same. I don't have access to his level of money. I don't do it as a full-time job. And I don't take HGA. Right? So, you don't have <laughs> allegedly, right? oh, yeah, I yeah, don't. Right. Although Drain Johnson's sewing is probably good for, for my. We all, we all love him. We all love him, but we know. I absolutely love him, but we all know he takes supplements, <laughs> yeah. right? So and unless you live that life, and it's part of the unethical program, the practices, I think, when a 20-year-old who's never had a kid says, you can look like me, to a mom mm -hmm. who's in her 40s, who's had three. It is just not going to happen. You know, I'm a, my only challenge to that, and not 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 on the supply-demand thing, because, yeah, you can be a cold, hard capitalist and say that that's what it is, is isn't this just, isn't this widespread regardless? In other words, I, I don't necessarily want to give a free pass to any other part of the health and fitness industry. I feel like oh, no, the health marketers and fitness are popping up right. everywhere, yes. even in weight loss. Yeah. Yeah. It's just they have to right, find the right angle and niche of of like desperation to hold on. Like, we're going to take your pain and we're just going to shove your face in this, you know, bowl of pain until you realize you have to buy your stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, absolutely right. And you know what? I'm okay with almost all of that. Yeah. Usually in the health and fitness industry. Yeah. The reason I struggle with it is because we're dealing with health issues for a wide group of people. Like if, like you with your shoulder, uh, your shoulder thing, if your shoulder is causing you a tremendous amount of pain and there's a ton of people selling shoulder rehab programs, but they're deliberately overcharging for what I think is a health issue that you can't help, then it becomes slightly different from saying, Ah, it's just another weight loss program, but I find oh, I a different see. way. It's a little but, bit like you don't have a choice versus just for me. a selective kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you're completely yeah. right in that the problem isn't with the health and fitness industry. The health and fitness industry does what it does, and that's make mm -hmm. money from a certain level of desperation. That's why I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. If I could eat Domino's all day, feel great, take a little bit. Yeah, we want our problem on the solved. Couch, yes. I take yeah, that. For sure. The problem is with the support not being there when it comes to healthcare systems and insurance providers and all that sort okay. of stuff. 
right? If that was freely available, like I think it should be, like I think it would be if this was a man problem, right? Mm -hmm. You can bet, I, I can, I have private medical insurance. I have the state one and I have private as well. I can get almost anything I want if we just go to the doctor and say, I've got private insurance. He says, oh, what do you want, Pete? <laughs> Here you go, pal. If, mm -hmm. if you look at France and Germany and several other countries, when you're postpartum, you get six uh, sessions or eight sessions, depending on where you are, with a postpartum health specialist, whether it's pelvic floor or whether that is someone that does okay. what I do. Okay. And that means there's no one in, in, in France selling this stuff in an unethical way. The health and fitness the, industry is not involved because okay. it's healthcare. And and that's kind of where I struggle <clears> a little <throat> bit with that sort of thing. I understand. Yeah. And and there's huge differences between, you know, the UK, the US systems as well. Oh, yeah. And so many health, uh, I think of like just lifting weights. I would love for insurance to cover strength training, but it's mm -hmm. too, it's too, it's not short-sighted enough for them. You know, for them, they have to tie it directly to some like immediate disease. It's like the weight yeah. loss drugs that have come out, Wagovi and mm -hmm. the other ones, you know, now that they know, that it reduces the risk of heart disease because you're helping a bunch of people lose weight. Wh whatever you're feeling on using that versus making lifestyle choices, that's a different mm -hmm. thing. Sure. Now the insurance companies are forced to look at that as, oh, maybe we should cover it because it's actually going to save us money <laughs> down the road with people yeah. not getting heart attacks. And maybe if they can make that connection, that but it, that's the insurance company, man. We're not going to solve that. In well, no, but so, it, but that that's exactly right. I, I, yeah. I did an interview with someone a while ago about exactly that. So she was asking me whether I was going to do more research into this. And I said, no, but the research we have to do is how much money will it save people to give women access to this stuff yeah. for free? Yeah. And that can be, on. I, I look at this as a women's equality issue. If you're looking at the gender pay gap and all that sort of stuff, part of that is going back to the office, feeling confident within yourself, feeling happy within yourself, not peeing yourself and mm -hmm. looking your best, feeling your best. So that after a year you can go back into the, uh, to your boss's office and say you can have a pay rise now, right? And is that, it the, is it the same with postpartum depression in the industry? Uh, yes, very much so. Yeah, very much so. so um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, some some heavy stuff to think about. It. I'm you know I'm curious. People listening should definitely reach out to to both of us about your thoughts on this because you know we're we're two guys with two opinions, uh, hopefully well informed with a lot of. Uh, information that we objectively, you know, analyze and try to be compassionate about, but everybody has their opinions and their experiences. So I did want to ask you one more thing, and that's about your podcast, the mm -hmm. Healthy Postnatal Body Podcast. What are, because you're you're at 200 something episodes now. Right? Uh, yeah, two, I, I just, for next week, it's 226. So this weekend will be 225. Oh, so 225, two plates. All right, 225 pounds. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, so you're getting your your passed into the the strength phase here. What are, what would you say are some of the biggest insights or surprises? I know that's a big question because you had a lot of episodes, but is there mm. one thing that sticks out as highly memorable that you know changed your perspective or taught you something that that you now carry with you forward? Yeah, that that that's, that's a good question. I, I for a long time I looked at this as a uh, this whole postpartum thing, I was I was your typical, I guess, typical PT from the personal trainers I see around me. I, I thought, okay, I do this. Why doesn't anybody understand that this is essential? Right? The same way lots of PTs look at strength training and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And the more people I spoke to, whether they were psychologists or parents, experts or whatever they were, the more it made me realize is that people have so much stuff happening in their life that all I can get for, especially postpartum women, there is so much more happening than what I ever thought. It's that that mental load of being a parent is, and you'll notice this at that, the mental load of just being a parent and having to do all the things you already have to do and then add a whole layer of human beings onto that and di different relationships between spouses and all that sort of stuff, how to navigate that new world. I mean, I remember what it was like for when, and I'm not comparing the two just a little bit, but when my wife and I got like a, a dog for the first time, it changes the thing. All of a sudden, you're just talking about poop and walkies and all that sort of stuff all sure. the time, right? And I thought that the postpartum recovery bit was significantly more important than it actually turned out to be. And I'm not saying that it isn't important. I just thought it was more important than it tends to be for the people actually going through postpartum recovery. I think 
I think this stuff is, but it, it, it meant that I had to change my approach to postpartum training. And that, that's why it mattered, right? So I used to say to people, do two to three sessions, 45 minutes with me a week. And you come to my studio. I had a very nice studio. It was amazing. I was all set up. Not realizing that that means putting a baby in a uh, crib, yeah. preparing the journey. That's half an hour to get there. Praying the kid stays for too quiet for 45 minutes, then go on back. So I asked these women to give up two to three, two hour slots a week for yeah. their postpartum recovery. That is insane. That is, that so is much to ask of just them, yeah. so unfair when you think about just asking someone and saying the only way you can do this is if you come to my studio and, and do it that way. Right. And that means that I had to completely not change my approach. The exercises stay the same, but I had to use find a different way. You have to be able to do a postpartum recovery thing. You have to be able to do it at home because mm -hmm. uh, you have to be, do, be able to do it in a short period of time because nobody has an hour mm -hmm. three times a week. We just don't. I mean, I can barely get myself to the gym three times a week for yeah. an hour. I have a home I gym want, for that reason. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I want 20 minute sessions. I don't want yeah. to do an hour three times a week. I want seven 20 minute sessions or whatever it is. So I had to be less equipment and it meant making stuff easier for people because I just had to change my whole approach to this stuff. And realizing that if people don't think this is important for them in the moment, it's not important for them. It's fine. If you've got other things to do, that is okay. Don't put it off forever. But right. just realize that when you have things like diastasis recti, you can wait a year before you address this. It is fine if you don't do it within the first year postpartum. There's no biggie. We'll fix it. We'll sort it. Just do your exercises a year later when you can. You squeeze it. Just chill about all this. When it's stuff. a priority. Yeah. No stress. No stress. I, I no love stress. this. No stress. Yeah. And finding a way to make it easier for the client. Uh, which it's funny because I I'm an online coach and same thing. Like I don't want to make all my clients constantly schedule calls when it's easier to send them videos or when it's easier to like yeah. do it asynchronously. Cause I'm yeah. like, you know what? That's stress. So that, that's pretty cool. I, I love that. that I, it's not something I thought you were going to say. I thought it was gonna be some very specific, you know, technical thing or, or topic. Awesome. Last question. I, I asked this of all guests, Peter, and that is, is mm -hmm. there something you wish I had asked you and what is your answer? Well, the thing is, you've you've coved an absolute ton of stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we did, we fair, did. <laughs> of, of, of all the of all the interviews I've done, you're definitely you know ridiculously well prepared, and and all that sort of stuff. So that that's Thank awesome. I, I think you know the the thing. What are other postnatal issues that need need a solution? Back pain, neck pain, and all that sort of stuff. And how are they linked? Is predominant, but it, again, it's a specific question. Unless you're sure. a physio, you're not going to ask it because you know you don't know that this, and um, and and that's pretty much it. You know, realizing that for anybody listening, back pain, postpartum back pain, postpartum neck pain, all that stuff, uh, postpartum um, uh, stiffness and all this sort of stuff can all be linked back do things like diastasis recti and giving birth and, and a weak pelvic floor and all that sort of stuff. And all this stuff, all this stuff, my answer is there is a solution for it and it's not complicated. None of this stuff is rocket science. I'm not a, and that's easy to say because I've been doing it for 10 to 12 years. So I'm very familiar. I can knock up, you've been a PT for, for a while. You can knock up a session plan in five minutes because you have years and years of expertise. Yeah, you, you're like right? ABC and I had to get you from here yeah. to there. Boom, boom, boom. boom. Yeah. Client says, I can't do this today. I want to do something else. Awesome. Give me five minutes. We'll be fine. Right. But postpartum recovery isn't isn't rocket science. It's not complicated. But we have to address all these issues in, in one one little ball. And that that is kind of the thing. We have to do more than just focus on the TVA and focus on the glitch. We have to okay. do everything in one go. That's if that one, yeah comes anywhere close to what your question actually was. Then that's yeah, awesome. uh, there's no wrong answer to that because you just add, told me a question you wished I would have asked. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> that's All, right. Right, yeah. All right. Well, you're a cool guy, Peter. And I imagine your clients got to love working with you because just, I mean, I, the energy I get from you and for those mm -hmm. listening and watching, I hopefully get the same thing as a guy who cares, who does have the solutions, even if they aren't rocket science, can get you quickly to that and is willing to help and is available to help. So where can listeners learn more about you and your work? And that includes uh, who around the world can get access to yours. Is it local or uh, do, you do it online? No, yeah. the, the, this is this is the big thing for me. So a few years ago, I was indeed just a personal trainer around Edinburgh and, and I had loads of questions. So I set up a website called healthypostnatalbody.com. 
handy title podcast kind of big on that. And it was very much a, we do what it says on the jar. The difference for healthypostnatalbody.com and, and, and all the other postpartum websites, you know that 13 week, 12 week program I talked about earlier that mm-hmm. someone says pay 99 pound a month uh, or a, a year. I give it to you for free. It doesn't cost you a penny. You sign up, you get three months free trial, right? The beauty is you can cancel on day one. You still get three months free access. Then after the three months, the program goes deeper because it goes into back pain and neck pain and all that sort of stuff. And that then I charge $10 a month or eight pounds a month, depending on where you are, uh, for five months. And that's the total cap. And you have lifetime access. Right? And that includes emailing me, Peter at healthypostnatalbody.com. I get emails every week from people saying, hey, how do I do this exercise? Completely free. It's all included. The reason I did that, because when you're asking who can access it, not everybody lives in the UK and the US and has a high level of disposable income. I have a ton of Eastern European uh, yeah. members. The eight to $10 a month isn't a lot of money for most Americans. Mm-hmm. It's not a lot of money for most British people. It is a tremendous amount of money for people living in certain parts of Asia and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So that I just said, listen, you pay, you pay nothing for three months. Make sure you cancel on day one. If you're never going to pay, don't sign up with a fake credit card. Right, because you can buy those things now. Fake credit cards, and after three months, they fail. I get charged for that stuff. Right? Just sign up on day one through PayPal or whatever. Cancel on day one. You get three months free. I still answer your emails. I don't care. And so, healthypostnatalbody.com. That's where everybody kind of gets access to the full program. And like I said, the program is. I think I just added month twelve or something like that mm-hmm. because after four months, the program splits up into what you want to work on: glutes, yeah. core all that sort of stuff, legs, shoulders, whatever you want to work on. But, you know, sign up for three months and then go away. It's also completely fine. Uh, awesome. And, of course, Healthy Postnatal Body Podcast is uh, out there for your listening entertainment every Sunday night, 6 p.m. UK time. So what's that, 1 p.m. Eastern? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah so I, about I five hours. It. Yeah, perfect. So anybody listening, you're on, a, you're on your podcast app right now. Go and follow or subscribe Healthy Postnatal Body podcast right now because yeah. it's the easiest thing for you to do and then the next easiest thing for you to do is if you or someone you love or woman in your life you think needs the help with uh what peter offers for postpartum recovery it sounds like you couldn't get a better bargain than free for 90 days and then it's up to you <laughs> it's, i mean yeah, i exactly. promoted way more expensive things than that for for guests and others so go for it jump in there's no risk uh Awesome. Very great conversation, Peter. So much really good uh, information that I wasn't aware of. It's going to help me and my clients and other women I know. So I'm sure the listeners got a ton from it as well. Thank you for coming. My absolute pleasure, man. It's been phenomenal.